Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask everyone in-house to make that courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. For those watching online, you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And of course, we will post today's program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference as well. Leading our discussion and welcoming our special guest is Paul Larkin, Senior Legal Research Fellow in our Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He directs Heritage's Overcriminalization Project, Counter the Abuse of the Criminal Law, particularly at the federal level. He served at the Department of Justice as an assistant to the Solicitor General and as an attorney in the Criminal Division Section on Organized Crime and Racketeering. He has also served as counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee and argued 27 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. Please join me in welcoming Paul Arkin. Paul? Thank you, John. We appreciate the introduction, and I appreciate everyone coming. You have a lot of options of what you can do with your day, and we appreciate you taking the time out to come here. Washington pundits must be enamored with Russian royalty because they always seem to want to label any new executive position a czar. In fact, Senator John McCain once said that it seemed like President Barack Obama had more czars than the Romanovs. Now, if I were to participate in that game, I would say that our guest today is the regulatory czar. But I think that term belittles both the office as well as the person who occupies it. Created in 1980, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs is the agency responsible for seeing to the implementation of the president's regulatory program. That is no small task. In 2017, where we are now and for the foreseeable future, the administrative state plays at least as great a lawmaking and law interpreting role as either Congress or the Supreme Court of the United States. Atop that, the costs of regulation are quite staggering. The total cost of the last eight years of rules adopted by the administrative state is quite breathtaking. The Obama administration issued more than 20,000 rules with $122 billion in cumulative costs. Now, maybe if you live in Washington, D.C., the number 122 billion doesn't seem like much. I think Senator Dirksen would have thought it's a lot, but in any event, maybe we've gotten a little more jaded since then. So let me give you some other examples, other ways of looking at it. 122 billion is larger than the number of stars in the galaxy. 122 billion is also larger than the number of seconds in 32 years. And if that doesn't strike you as big, then there's probably very little hope for you uh, as far as understanding what big may be. Now, the job of managing the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs falls to our guest, Naomi Rao a graduate of Yale College and the University of Chicago Law School, Ms. Rao had a distinguished career before entering the Trump administration. She was a law clerk for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. She worked as a lawyer in the White House Counsel's Office. She worked as a staffer to the Senate Judiciary Committee. And she was a faculty member of the Antonin Scalia School of Law at George Mason University, where she founded the Center for the Study of the Administrative State. Since July of this year, she has been the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, and is as conversant with the Trump administration's regulatory policy as anyone else in the government today. Without further ado, we have the privilege of listening to our guest, in her first public address on the administrative state. Please join me in giving a hand to our guest, 
Administrator Naomi Rao. Thanks so much, Paul, for that generous introduction. And thanks for inviting me here and to the team at Heritage uh, for having me participate in this important series on preserving the Constitution. Um, I have here in my notes that I was going to have a joke. I asked my staff for a joke, but it's still going through cost-benefit analysis. And, uh, and we don't have that yet. So um, we'll just get on with things. So, so as many of you are aware, President Trump has really emphasized regulatory reform as a key component of his administration. And I think that the president's election in many ways represents part of a broader reaction against the excesses of government and in particular regulatory interference. We can see it's part of a movement against government paternalism and meddling in the lives and property and decisions of individuals. The previous administration, as Paul has already mentioned, imposed an incredibly high level of unnecessary regulatory burdens on the American people. And so rolling back these regulations is essential to restoring more individual freedom and to promoting economic growth, job creation, and innovation. So in my remarks today, I plan to highlight two main principles about administration. I want to talk first about how we need a much smaller and more effective um, regulatory state. And second, we need much more accountable and responsive administration. More accountable administration is essential to bringing the federal government closer to the constitutional structure and to restoring the checks and balances between Congress, the president, and the courts. And I, I think about this really in some big terms, right? I mean, reaffirming more constitutional government, which I know is important to many of you, is really in some ways first and foremost today about tackling systematic regulatory reform. And those reforms include reducing the regulatory burden, includes carefully analyzing the authority that agencies are exercising, and making sure that they're within, um, that the benefits are very substantial compared to their costs. And we also want to make sure that we are promoting due process and fair notice by repealing and discouraging the use of guidance and other sub-regulatory actions. OK, so let me start first with some of the practical realities of administration and why we need less regulation as well as more effective regulation. Most of the authority of the federal government is exercised through administrative agencies that create regulations, enforce those regulations, and also at times adjudicate cases under their regulations. Now, to be sure, regulatory actions can sometimes implement important health, safety, and welfare priorities that have been set by Congress. But administrative agencies that operate on their own inertia often create regulations that are overly burdensome and fail to deliver any real benefits. So today we have on the books many regulations that are arguably inconsistent with law, regulations that have never worked or are no longer working, regulations that cause affirmative harm, and regulations that are duplicative or simply unnecessary. Far too many regulations are a solution in search of a problem rather than a response to an actual market failure. And indeed, what you see is excessive regulation often provides an advantage to large and well-connected businesses that can easily afford compliance costs, often at the expense of smaller or upstart companies. The previous administration, by OMB's own and probably quite conservative estimate, imposed as much as $80 billion in annualized costs, um, which is hundreds of billions of dollars over the lives of those regulations. And this level of involvement of government in the choices of individuals and businesses has slowed economic growth and stifled innovation. An excessive regulation impedes individual liberty for all Americans, makes it harder to get a job, makes it harder to start and maintain a small business, makes ordinary goods and services much more expensive, and it limits the choices that we have in the marketplace. And we've also seen that very expansive social regulations can impede choices that are fundamental to religious exercise and to freedom of conscience. So reducing these overall regulatory burdens is part of returning government to its proper and limited role and giving the American people greater control over their lives, their work, and their property. President Trump has set some very ambitious goals for shrinking the regulatory burden. 
In a series of executive orders, he's directed agencies to follow a policy that should result in the elimination of at least two regulations for every new one. He's also directed agencies to reduce the overall regulatory burden, and he's established regulatory reform officers and regulatory reform task forces in each of the agencies. I'm here to tell you that nine months in, the president's agenda is working. For fiscal year 2017, which just concluded, across the administration, we have more than met the two for one requirement. We're still receiving and tabulating some of the results, but the administration looks set to exceed this objective that the president set. And perhaps even more impressive, we've kept regulatory costs to below zero. We didn't just reduce the growth of new costs, but we actually, on net, reduced more regulatory costs than we've imposed. The pace and the scope of deregulation that's occurred is truly unprecedented, and we're just getting started. We've removed or postponed more than 860 planned regulations that were in the pipeline. Through the Congressional Review Act, the President and Congress have eliminated 14 major regulations. Um, and the administration has also been working to roll back a wide range of burdensome regulatory requirements in the form of guidance and other actions that are not formal regulations. These sub-regulatory actions are often pernicious because they can occur without any public notice or comment. For example, the Department of Education's guidance on Title IX and sexual harassment on campus imposed significant obligations on universities without going through notice and comment rulemaking. The Education Department has recently withdrawn that guidance, and administration-wide, we continue to make careful scrutiny of guidance a real priority. Looking ahead to fiscal year 18, the President has called on every agency to set a negative regulatory cost allocation, which means that each agency should reduce their overall regulatory burden in 2018, not just impose no new costs. And we're in the process this month of working with the agencies on their fall regulatory agendas and regulatory plans, and we're pushing them to identify as many deregulatory actions as possible. So what we've seen in the past is that there's been really a very steady upward trajectory of new regulatory burdens. And that upward trajectory has continued across both Democratic and Republican administrations. But we are focused on turning back this tide. We're not just slowing, as I've said, the pace of growth, but actually shrinking the overall government, putting us on a negative trajectory. And we're working hard to fundamentally change the culture at agencies so that they are thinking first and foremost about how to reduce costs and lift burdens and reform outdated regulations rather than just piling on new costs and new burdens. So much less and more effective regulation is an important goal of this administration, and it's animated by these broader principles of individual liberty and more accountable government. So that brings me to my second main point, which is restoring the accountability of administration within the structure of the Constitution. So my office, OIRA, is often considered the wonkiest of all government office, offices, and indeed there are many wonky parts of my job. I just received an email from a staff member announcing a very exciting new present value calculator. Um, so my excellent staff and I do focus on the details of regulation and their costs and benefits, and that's certainly important. But from my perspective, I view this office as much more than just the green eye shade. I consider the president's regulatory reform efforts as fundamentally about restoring accountability and promoting more constitutional government. So in addition to some of the more specific and practical achievements I've already outlined, I want to discuss some of these foundational principles and the place of administration in the Constitution structure. And this involves thinking about the three separate and coordinate branches of the federal government and the role they play in creating, enforcing, and checking administrative authority. As an officer in the executive branch, I'll focus most on our efforts there, but I also want to discuss the important roles of Congress and the courts. So let's begin where the Constitution begins, with Congress. Most talk of administration tends to focus on the executive branch, to debates about unitary executive theory, or to consider the problems of judicial review and deference to agencies. But it seems to me that the real root of administration is Congress. 
Now, it's true that a significant amount of regulatory activity is discretionary. And as I explained, this administration is already working hard to review, reform, and where appropriate, to repeal such activity. But in many contexts, there are statutory requirements and statutory limits that executive agencies must follow. And the President's executive orders on regulatory reform appropriately extend only insofar as consistent with law. So in the long run, Congress really has to play a central role in reducing the scope and reach of regulation. It's an observation that's consistent with the Constitution, which at the outset, in Article 1, Section 1, vests all legislative power of the federal government in Congress. As part of its enumerated powers, Congress creates administrative agencies. Congress also establishes for each agency its leadership and structure, its particular forms of accountability, and its funding. But perhaps most important, Congress sets the statutory authority for agencies. Administrative agencies have no inherent regulatory or other powers. It's emphatically not the rule that agencies may do anything that is not prohibited by the statute. Really, quite to the contrary, agencies can act only with express authorization from Congress. And this point seems to me so obviously true, yet I think it bears restating and emphasizing in the current regulatory environment. Over the years, particularly since the start of the 20th century, Congress has transferred ever more policymaking discretion to the agencies. With only the loosest guidance from Congress, agencies in many areas now have the ability to set far-reaching policy through regulations, enforce that policy, and then adjudicate that policy. This structure combines the three powers of the federal government and blurs the Constitution's careful separation of powers. To restore more constitutional accountability, Congress could delegate less authority to the executive branch. As noted, Article I vests all legislative power of the United States in Congress. Another way of saying this is that only Congress can exercise the legislative power. And although we know that the Supreme Court does not vigorously enforce its non-delegation doctrine, the court in every case to raise the issue has reaffirmed the non-delegation principle as a cornerstone of Republican government. I explain in a forthcoming Law Review article that non-delegation may be one of the most important structural features of maintaining a government of limited and enumerated powers, a government of, by, and for the people. Now, I'm not naive. I've lived in Washington a long time. Um, so I recognize that limiting delegation is a, is a kind of tall order. But nonetheless, it seems to me essential for thorough regulatory reform and a restoration of more limited and accountable government. In a more practical way, Congress can also take more direct action toward regulatory reform and focus its legislation on deregulation. It's often very difficult for Congress to enact complex regulatory schemes. That's why we have the problem of excessive delegation in the first place. But nonetheless, in some ways, the legislative process is actually well-suited to deregulation. For agencies, deregulation is hard, um, something I've learned in the past three months. Even when an agency knows that a regulation is no longer working or is excessively burdensome, deregulation requires following a complex administrative process and then facing potentially years of uncertainty in the courts. By contrast, if a regulation isn't working, Congress can repeal it by statute. Congress can simply deregulate through legislation and override an agency's determination. So I think Congress has a real opportunity, not just through the Congressional Review Act, but in general through its legislative power to clear out bad regulations and bolster the overall deregulatory efforts for this and future administrations. So that brings me to Article II and to the President who can have, in many ways, the most immediate impact on administration. Article II vests all, legis all executive power in the president, which makes the president not only the commander in chief, but also the administrator in chief. The president has the authority to direct and to control the execution of the laws through administrative agencies. His obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed includes the power to ensure that his subordinates are, in fact, faithfully executing the law. And President Trump has taken leadership of administration in a very direct and effective way through a series of executive orders and the appointment to the cabinet of individuals who are committed to regulatory reform. 
And the importance of presidential direction of administration has been noted really across the political spectrum. It's been noted by Justice Kagan and Justice Scalia, by Professor Cass Sunstein, um, a predecessor of mine in Atawira, and also um, conservative proponents of a strong unitary executive like Stephen Calabresi and Gary Lawson. And that's in part because presidential control of administration serves some very important and vital goals. It's more energetic and decisive, and it's accountable and responsive to the people. Executive branch officials should report up through the chain of command, ultimately to the president. And when administration reflects presidential priorities, it promotes important democratic principles. Elections should truly have consequences for administration, Otherwise, we will have an unconstitutional fourth branch of government. In my office, OIRA, we play a key role in ensuring presidential direction of administration. Our authority includes formally reviewing significant rules, and agencies don't finalize these rules before OIRA has concluded its review. OIRA can play an important role in promoting an accountable and unitary executive we coordinate within the executive office of the president between the president's close advisors. We also coordinate a robust interagency review, which ensures that issues are fleshed out from different perspectives and hopefully eliminating duplicative or inconsistent regulations across the executive branch. So I like to think of OIRA as combining the green eye shade with some of these broader principles. And we do this in a number of ways. So we try to make sure at OIRA, first and foremost, that when agencies act, they act within the requirements of the law. Um, when agencies have been conferred a regulatory power, they should interpret and exercise that power within constitutional limits, including with respect for the non-delegation principle. It also means recognizing that agencies have no free-floating regulatory authority. In the past, sometimes regulations have been enacted with only the loosest connection to legal authority. By contrast, we expect agencies to identify the source of their regulatory power before they proceed. Second, we view government with a fair amount of humility. We start by assuming that individuals and businesses should be left as free as possible to make decisions. And I'd like to point out that these ideas are not new to this administration. In fact, they're reflected in President Clinton's Executive Order 12866, which has been in effect since 1993. And that executive order, which sort of sets out the centralized regulatory review process of OIRA, emphasizes that government should regulate only when necessary, such as when there's been a material market failure. It also suggests that regulations need to have a substantial net benefit for the American people before agencies can move forward. And also that agencies should impose the least possible regulatory burden. So in this administration, we're trying to reinvigorate some of these simple yet important ideas. For instance, we're focusing more on retrospective review. Everyone agrees that the government should carefully look at the actual costs and benefits of existing regulations, but in practice, it's been done only sporadically. President, Trump, President Trump's two-for-one executive order puts real muscle behind retrospective review. It's going to have to be an ongoing part of what agencies do. Moreover, regulatory reform officers and task forces in every agency are working on systematic efforts to evaluate and to reduce regulatory burdens. As I said, we're currently reviewing agency agenda submissions, and, and we're going to have more information about their actions in the coming months. Moreover, we're trying also to proceed with our deregulation efforts in a transparent and open manner. Agencies are actively have actively for months been seeking public comments on deregulatory ideas and engaging with individuals and regulated entities about the costs and the benefits of regulation. Another thing OIRA does is that it must ensure that when regulatory action is permitted, when it's permitted under the law, that still the agency is only proceeding when necessary and when the benefits truly outweigh the costs. I mean, one might ask, why would the executive branch interpret laws to burden rather than benefit the people? And so insofar as consistent with law, agencies should implement only regulations with substantial net benefits. And we need to ensure that those benefits are being calculated based on accurate information and reasonable assumptions. 
The last administration was able to justify many of its costliest regulations by using so-called benefits calculations that relied on some very tenuous assumptions. Similarly, deregulatory actions also have to meet our rigorous cost-benefit standards. We want, to we want to assure that deregulatory actions are responsible and are not dismantling regulations that may be working for, and serving important public purposes. Finally, OIRA is working also with other parts of the White House, particularly the White House Counsel's Office, to ensure that agencies action, agency actions have respect for both due process and fair notice. In practice, this means carefully reviewing guidance documents to make sure that they are truly guidance interpreting regulations rather than backdoor attempts to impose new regulatory burdens. The last administration frequently used guidance in this manner to impose such obligations on the public, but we're cracking down on these practices. We want to make sure that when the federal government exercises its power to regulate, it does so in a way that provides notice to regulated parties and the public. So we are putting principles of presidential accountability and direction into practice, in particular through systematic and institutional push for reducing regulatory burdens and promoting more effective regulation. And that brings me to Article 3. I just want to say a few words about the judicial review of administrative action. Um, as Paul mentioned, I was a, a law professor previously, and I know there's a robust scholarly industry thinking through and measuring judicial difference, revisiting Chevron, talking about legislation that um, purports to overturn deference regimes. I may have even held a few conferences on the subject, um, but I don't plan to go into the details of these debates. I'd just like to take note, however, of a few key principles in this area. First, the practice of judicial review of agency action is diverse and not easily captured by formulas of deference. So often there's not a single target of Chevron deference because courts interpret and apply these doctrines in very different ways. Second, the practice of deference cannot be separated from the current acceptance of very expansive delegations to agencies. Third, the Administrative Procedure Act already requires that courts decide all questions of law. As Justice Scalia often, noticed, often noted, a thorough and careful interpretation of the statutory text can often lead the court to a clear answer rather than ambiguity. Fourth, irrespective of doctrines of judicial deference, the courts continue to have a duty to say what the law is. It's part of the judicial power, and it's part of their obligation to decide cases and controversies. I think if you think about these basic principles, it should lead to a more robust review of regulatory action in the courts. In particular, courts should consider whether an agency has any statutory authority for its actions. It means looking at the scope and reach of delegated authority. I think courts should also carefully review whether agencies have followed statutory procedures, and they should push back against sub-regulatory actions that impose new obligations without notice and comment rulemaking. I think courts can provide more meaningful checks on agency action and authority, enforcing both statutory and constitutional due process. And we've seen over the past few years that the Supreme Court, particularly Justices Thomas, Alito, and, and Gorsuch, are engaged in a reconsideration of the non-delegation doctrine and the judicial deference doctrines. That brings me to my conclusion. Um, the Constitution has carefully provided a structure for administration of the laws. But today, as I've noted, we've moved much farther away from that structure to a regulatory state that often operates with minimal congressional guidance, inconsistent presidential direction, and deferential judicial review. So returning to a more constitutional government requires all three branches to exercise their constitutional responsibilities. President Trump has launched major regulatory reforms. Some members of Congress have introduced reform bills. Judges and justices have indicated the need for more probing judicial review. Let's hope that each branch succeeds in its sphere, because limiting the reach of regulation will promote individual liberty, restore more accountable government, and ultimately benefit the American people. More needs to be done, but changes are happening, and I remain optimistic about the possibilities for lasting regulatory reform. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I look forward to your questions. <laughs>
Now comes the part of our program that is colloquially known as the Spanish Inquisition. I'm going to ask a few questions and then I will allow the audience to ask some questions. And let me start out by this one, a broad, broadly structured question. The administrative state has been with us for about 80 years. In the New Deal era and then in the 70s, it underwent marked expansions. Do we reach a point, are we there now, or will we reach a point where the cost of undoing what has been created to date doesn't justify the benefits of that? Um, well, I hope we haven't reached that point today. Um, I'm not sure I would have taken this job if I wasn't optimistic about the possibility of, of rolling some of this back. But I think, um, you know, if we see a problem of constitutional accountability, I think there can always be efforts made to restore more constitutional government. And I think the benefits of that are so far-reaching and important that, that they should be undertaken, at least insofar as possible, regardless of the cost. The last five or 10 years have witnessed a continued interest in challenging not just individual aspects of what the administrative state does, but the actual legitimacy of the administrative state as a whole. You've talked about the structure of the Constitution. The framers, when they created that structure, could not possibly have imagined several different developments that we've seen since then. Congress's increase in its Commerce Clause power, the size and power of administrative agencies, including the ability to demand that courts defer to their interpretation of the stat of statutes, limitations on the president's ability to remove people, and uh, the ability of agencies to issue rules, whether in the form of statutes, or junior varsity statutes, I should say, or guidance documents that have the same force and effect as an act of Congress. Do you see any of those specific sorts of areas undergoing retrenchment over the, the next four or eight years? Is it likely that the Supreme Court will be willing to go along with cutting back? And do you think the Trump administration will ask the Supreme Court to cut back on those? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I do think that at least, as I mentioned, some justices are, are moving towards a reconsideration of some of these fundamental things, such as the non-delegation doctrine, and to, re, to looking again at judicial deference doctrines. Um, with respect to retrenchment, um, I think one thing that we can do in the executive branch is that we can take seriously the obligation not to interpret our authority expansively, and, and we are doing that. That's something we can do. Um, you know, some of those other actions will require both Congress and the courts to be more assertive. And I think that there are some signs of interest in this. I do think that there are members of Congress who are interested in serious regulatory reform and to restoring Congress's role in the legislative power. And I think that there are judges and justices who are, who are thinking through this and, and pushing forward on doctrinal changes. Let me ask you. Uh, GW law professor Christopher Carrigan recently published a book entitled Structured to Fail, Regulatory Performance Under Competing Mandates. He talked about the problem that sometimes Congress gives agencies rather conflicting responsibilities, such as promoting oil drilling and then regulating what the drillers do. Uh, and he said when, you, when Congress does that, is there is a great opportunity uh, for one or the other of those responsibilities to fall by the wayside. As part of the, the president's regulatory reform movement, is he going to look at trying to, say, reorganize agencies to make sure that that problem doesn't arise? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Mick Mulvaney, who's the director of OMB, is undergoing a, an important you know, government reorganization effort, which is looking through a lot of these issues and how the agencies interact and have overlapping authority. So that's sort of a, a structural thing, you know, how do we reorganize the government? And, and within my office, there is a lot of interagency discussion, right, trying to figure out where agencies have overlapping or possibly conflicting authorities and how we can negotiate and manage that. Because you're right, Congress does sometimes do that. And then partly within the executive branch, we have to dis we have to determine how to interpret those potentially conflicting, conflicting requirements. 
You mentioned uh, cost-benefit analysis, and, it, and it's a controversial issue. There are some people that say agencies should never engage in cost-benefit analysis unless Congress expressly directs them to do so. But a few years ago, the Supreme Court, in a case entitled Michigan versus EPA, said it would be irrational for an agency to adopt a rule that had enormous costs and had far fewer benefits. Mm -hmm. Will the Trump administration take the position that that's the correct way of, of looking at this problem and encourage agencies always to do a cost-benefit analysis unless Congress has prohibited them from doing so? I think that is our general view, right? I mean, where most statutes are silent on the question of cost-benefit analysis. And so then within the executive branch, we have to determine what policy should go forward. And it does seem irrational to adopt a policy where there are no real benefits to the American people. There are a few statutes, not very many, that prohibit cost-benefit analysis. And in those cases, you know, we have to follow Congress's decree. But, um, but yes, in general, and I think that's actually, it's not a new position, right? It is the position that's in the existing executive orders that um, regulation should move forward when benefits exceed costs. So, um, you know, we are, I guess, just reaffirming those longstanding principles and taking them seriously. The administrative state consists not only of political appointees, but career government employees. And there are several professors, such as Paul Verkeil and John DiUlio, who've said we should get back to the old model of giving bureaucrats more authority in this regard. I think what they're thinking of, perhaps, is the British model, which is one where the civil servants do essentially whatever the prime minister says they want to do. I'm not sure that happens in our government. Uh, a professor by the name of Rosemary O'Leary wrote a book, The Ethics of Dissent, Managing Guerrilla Government, in which she argued there are a fair number of career civil service employees who are perfectly willing and able to act as fifth columnists if they think the political people in a new administration are not doing what they think is right. And we've seen the EPA had a large number of its employees demonstrate outside Trump Tower after uh, President Trump was elected. How do you recommend your colleagues deal with this sort of problem in particular agencies or government-wide? Uh, um, well, I mean, I guess as a principled matter, I tend to believe in the unitary executive. And as I said, the president is the administrator in chief. And so he should direct and control what his subordinates are doing. And, and that should filter down through his political appointees to the career bureaucrats. Um, but the question you raise is an important one. I mean, in my experience being on the job for a few months is that there are actually many career civil servants who are working hard on the president's agenda, and they are working with their political <coughs> officers to help identify regulations that aren't working and are really working as part of the deregulatory efforts. I'm sure there may also be others who are, who are resisting. But I think in the agencies that we've seen that are, that are most successful in their efforts, they have found a way to work with their career officials. And I think that that's very important if this reform is going to be effective. Um, you know, I also feel lucky in my office, I have really an excellent career staff who is very committed to the things that we're trying to do. So, so from my own personal experience, um, I've had a great experience working with the career staff. But, but it, is, it is a problem, and it's, it's more of a problem in some agencies than others. But, but in terms of advice, I guess I would just encourage um, political officials to, to find career bureaucrats that they can work with because they can't do everything on their own. Earlier this year, the Trump administration and Congress vigorously used the Congressional Review Act to eliminate, as you said, 14 different regulations. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that were adopted, say, from June of 2016 up until the time <coughs> we had a switch of administrations. Is the administration going to try to aggressively use that statute to reach back beyond uh, June of 2016 in cases where agencies didn't comply with the Congressional Review Act and didn't submit rules to Congress? I know that's a question you're very interested in, right, and have written about, uh, Paul. You know, it is something that we are, we are looking at and considering because we do want our agencies to follow the rule of law, and the Congressional Review Act is part of the law. Um, you know, some of these regulations have now been implemented and have been on the books now for a number of years. So I, I think one of the things we have to consider is what might be some of the unintended or cascading consequences 
of, of bringing up the CRA issues now. But it is something that we are, we are interested in and looking at. I'll now turn to the audience to see if they have any questions. Let me just make a few points at the outset. First, please wait until you have the microphone. Second, please identify who you are and your organization. Third, please ask a question rather than make a speech. And to, on that point, let me say that making a speech and then adding at the end, do you agree with me, is not a question. <laughs> so please. Down here in front. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Kami Bhatt. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And my question is that if your speech is not overly optimistic, and I'm asking this question in the context of budget deficit, Reagan came with this determination to reduce the bureaucracy, cut the red tape, deregulate the economy, and he was elected twice. If you talk with a person like Grover Norquist privately, he would tell you Reagan wasn't able to do this. Media gave no respect to our president, but your talk is making him too big or too powerful. So again, I mean, are you sure that he would be successful in this area? Thanks. Well, um, I'm old enough, I guess, to, to never be quite sure that anything will happen um, in Washington, but, but I think I am optimistic. I mean, I think the results that we've seen from the agencies is that this is working, you know, that we have reduced the regulatory burdens. We've sort of turned, we're working on turning around the battleship and it's turning. And, um, you know, I can't predict what all the consequences will be after four or eight years, but I do remain optimistic. And, and I think, I think that there's some enormous potential here to really have reform that benefits the American people. Here in the front. Yes. A brown jacket, bow tie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Richard Belzer. I'm, uh, I've been a consultant for 16 years, and if you're successful, I'll have to get a real job. <laughs> uh, I'm also an OIRA alumnus. And I noticed in your talk didn't uh, reach the Paper Production Act, <clears throat> but your um, recent memo to the EEOC relied on the Paper Production Act, and I haven't seen anything like that in at least 20 years. So I'm wondering if that is a, an indication of the a commitment to use the Paperwork Act as a deregulatory tool, or it may be just a one-off. Well, I think in many ways the Paperwork Reduction Act is a kind of deregulatory mechanism created by Congress, right? Because so much of the regulatory burden comes in the form of paperwork. And so Congress, I think, by establishing a structure that requires, you know, OMB, OIRA approval of paperwork um, and information collections is, is a sign that this is an important part of keeping the regulatory burden as minimal as possible. So I, I think that's an important part of, of the statute and its goals. There. Oh, great, thanks. Naomi, thank you for your talk. It was mm -hmm. very thought provoking. And I want to. Um, Name? Paul Noe, sorry, American Force and Paper Association. I want to go back to the. Um, some of the discussion you had about judicial deference, because it seems to me there's been a trend in the courts towards, uh, how shall I say it, a stricter application of the law, a questioning of Chevron deference, and the court sort of reasserting their uh, obligation to uh, interpret the law consistent with Marbury versus Madison. And um, there, I think, so there's an evolution towards where there's straightforward legal questions towards de novo review. Uh, so a greater role for the courts there. But in the area of policy making, it seems to me they're essentially opening a door for the executive branch to do more. Because in areas where you just have pure policy making, so the question is, for example, was the agency reasonable? Traditional legal tools fall apart. Tannins of statutory construction don't really work. Courts are not so well suited to resolve those issues. And that's a question of executive branch implementation. And there I see them being very deferential, this same school that in many ways is being much tougher as judges, OK? And so my question for you is, isn't that an area where uh, 
the executive branch can do more. More, for example, in its application of the executive order. Yes, it's been roughly the same words for the last 35 years, but administration after administration hasn't, in my opinion, been all that tough about pushing the question of how the agency should implement its statute consistent with it. So your thoughts there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, with respect to the relationship between judicial deference and leaving policy making, policy making open to the executive branch, um, I think the questions of deference are difficult in part because they really, in my view, can't be separated from the fact that we've essentially reached a point where we allow very expansive delegations to agencies. So agencies um, have sometimes very open-ended delegated authority, and, and then they make policy under those delegations. And what is a court supposed to do with that if they're not going to enforce a non-delegation principle? So I do think that there's a balance there because it's important for courts to exercise their responsibility to say what the law is. Um, but you know, if you sort of start with an assumption that agencies can have very broad delegated authority, how do you have judicial review over their policy making under that delegated authority? Which is why I think the question is actually, the question of what to do about deference is difficult unless you are willing to also tackle the non-delegation question. Down from uh, name of thank, thank you for your public service, Michael Maybach with the Heritage Foundation. Question about institutions: We have uh, a Congress that is operating almost always on continuing resolutions rather than regular order. Would it be useful to discuss moving to a two-year budget so that the second year of each Congress would be oversight rather than continuous budget uh, process? Hmm. It's an interesting idea. I, I admit I'm no expert on the congressional budget process, but uh, maybe that's a question for, for Mick Mulvaney, should he, should he come. Okay. Uh, Alden Abbott Heritage. Uh, major regulatory costs are imposed by the independent agencies. And up to now, uh, they have uh, been outside of the scope of uh, OIRA oversight. I mean, given the constitutional legal arguments the President's Take Care Authority, among other things, uh, is OIRA seriously considering uh, uh, bringing to bear its uh, oversight authority over uh, independent uh, agency regulatory actions? Yeah, um, thanks, Alden, for that question. Um, you know, I think it's been since Ronald Reagan, you know, issued the initial executive orders, there's been an ongoing question about whether review should apply to the independent agencies. And, um, you know, the Office of Legal Counsel has issued opinions suggesting that that would certainly be constitutional. I think for an administration that's seriously committed to regulatory reform and greater executive branch accountability, it's a, it's a question we, we absolutely need to, to look at. Um, and there are a number of, so I think there's a constitutional issue there, and I've written about this in the past, but I think also as a practical matter, these independent agencies, many of them don't conduct any form of cost-benefit analysis, as you say, um, and their rules can be tremendously burdensome on the public. So, so you know, a complete regulatory reform is going to require thinking about how to, um, how to address the question of independent agencies. And it's an issue also, um, I mean, it's been around for a long time. Both the American Bar Association and the Administrative Conference of the United States have recommended centralized regulatory review of independent agencies for, I think, over 20 years. So it's an issue that's been, been kicking around for a long time and, uh, and I think deserves further, further consideration. Over there on my left. Dan Albin with the Institute for Justice. You mentioned several times the sort of sub-regulatory authority that agencies are often operating under the guidance that they issue and that this administration is planning to do uh, something about that. Given that most of those things aren't covered by things like the Paperwork Reduction Act unless there are forms required to fill out, what specifically is the administration planning to do or what is OIRA planning to do to vet this guidance? Is there going to be a review of, of guidance that comes out or a review of guidance that's already been issued? Uh, sure, well, a couple of things. One, um, OIRA does often bring in 
significant guidance for actual formal OIRA review. We also informally review guidance from the agencies and, you know, Part of it is sometimes we don't know something is happening, but we are doing our best to sort of bring as much of that into our office and review it as we can. Um, also, as part of their general deregulatory efforts, um, many agencies are in the process of identifying all of their guidance documents. So sort of taking a, a look back and like figuring out what guidance have they issued, what guidance do they still want to continue to support, and also to making that guidance more transparent. So that's something else that we're working with the agencies on, which I think can be quite impactful because that will help bring greater transparency to the guidance that remains. And I think it is also an opportunity for agencies to clear out the guidance that they no longer support. And, and many of the agencies are doing this in a very kind of thorough and systematic way. Can I, can I follow up on that? Will guidance documents count uh, towards the two for one? Um, they count. Um, so if you repeal a, if you, yeah, I mean, it can. Yeah, I mean, and also it's, um, I mean, it can count for regulatory cost savings. You know, so if you were, if an agency repeals a guidance um, and that results in cost savings, that can count as reducing the overall regulatory burden. In the back. Hi, I'm Diane Katz here with Heritage. Thank you so much for joining us. OIRA, last count, I think had a roughly 50 staff members or so, which means you're vastly, um, you know, outnumbered by the regulatory agencies and, and all of the work that they're putting out. In the review for reorganization, um, are you or is Mr. Mulvaney looking toward either expanding um, OIRA staff in any way or beefing up, you know, the uh, the members? Yeah, we're. I like to think of it. We're small but mighty. Um, but yes, we are hoping that we will have resources for additional staff members. Um, I think that's something that's been been proposed in the in the president's budget, and um, so yes, I'm hopeful. It's hard to say. Um, you know, we could certainly use you know quite a few more people. I mean, originally, I think OIRA was around 90 people, and it's been. I mean, we have I think 45 or 50 people in the office right now. So. So there's sort of, and the pace of regulation has only increased in that time. So I think we could certainly stand to ramp up in our staffing. Can I ask you that? Is, uh, was that an effort to sort of strangle in the crib any effort to cut back on regulations? Because if you go from 90 to 45 people, you obviously can't expect that 45 people are going to do the same you know, work that 90 can. Mm -hmm. Uh, did that happen over the last eight years as a way of making sure re more and more regulations would go out the door? I think it's happened even before that time. Um, it sort of happened over time, is my understanding. And I mean, you know, if you, but it's true. I mean, if you are a very pro-regulatory administration, then you are not going to appreciate the work that OIRA does because it's seen as a roadblock to, to pushing ahead with regulation. So I do think, I mean, keeping our staff low is one way of not having sufficient checks over what the agencies are doing. In the back there. effectiveness uh, to answer Mr. Larkin's question the cuts that OIRA sustained over the last 25 years were not made by the Congress they were made by the directors of OMB of both parties it was reduced 50 percent by administrators and directors of OMB by both parties not the Congress and it suggests to me that uh, an objective is equal to a any importance that we've discussed today is that OIRA has to broaden its constituency to someone more than one, which is the president. Because over the long run, there needs to be outside groups that support the agency. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not asking a question, I'm answering your question. It was done by OMB, not to Congress, and it did go down 50%. Right here in the front? Uh, they'll give you the mic, hold on. <coughs> Hi, I'm Paul Marion from MLEX, a uh, business news service focused on regulation. And I wanted to ask, there's been some talk in Congress and some industries about a move to performance-based regulation, which, I, as I understand it, would be essentially self-regulation with some kind of government oversight. 
And I wanted to get your views on that. Um, you know, I think performance-based regulation is often a great option, right? If, if regulation is really necessary, it's often far more effective to set a performance standard rather than a government mandate. So I think where it's consistent with law and appropriate, I think that can be, that can be a, a good way of having a more light touch to regulation. I think we have time for one more question. Sir, right there. They'll bring you the mic. Uh, Alan Carpian, um, recently retired EPA bureaucrat um, who woke up on Wednesday morning after the election and said, oh my God, I went back in. I have a specific issue to ask about, a very small one. <laughs> and that, this is a small issue, climate change, and another specific small regulation, the climate plan. And my, my question is, point person. I've, I've noticed so many organizations, CEI, uh, Heartland. I just yesterday spoke to a scientist who had done some work and wanted to see, how do I get this before EPA, and so on and so forth. And I said, well, what EPA needs is a, a very obvious point person, not just the administrator, on the issue of climate change, and there doesn't seem to be one. And it's, to me, it's a very practical issue. Mm. Um, I mean, I think the EPA is, you know, it's, it's really a team effort, probably an issue too big for a single point person, but it's, it's an issue that is receiving a lot of attention from the EPA yeah. leadership, I can, I can assure you. Listen, please join me in thanking our guest for coming today.